painfully statement. President Deki passionately looked at his fellow South Africans and made this painful awakening statement regarding the future of this country. He made this statement before 2024 elections, which led to the so called G. It's a very complex question, and uh, when you raise this, that there was some intervention that was made which results in this change. People take time to absorb that. Before I play you a clip by former President Tabom Peik, it's important for me to play you a video by Rob Hezo that will make you understand what is going on to this country. And then it will open your eyes to what is going on behind the scene. What is it that is trying to destroy? to destabilize the black democratic government and what is it that they're gonna gain from doing so. Uh, please listen to this clip by Rob Hazel. Then after it, I'm gonna play you a clip by former president Sabun So there's a concept called state proofing that has been introduced a number of years ago, but it's been caught the national attention, at least for the opposition. And state proofing is protecting yourself against the actions of the government. And it's quite depressing when you think about people and companies having to do that, to state proof yourself. It's have your own electricity, have your own water supply, try and have your own security, try and educate your children privately, you know, try and have private medical, because you know the government cannot provide these services, they're incompetent. President Mbeki and President Zuma have been warning us about the cabal or the counter-revolutionaries who are running a parallel state who are helping to make sure that democratic black government fails. Please listen to this clip um, where former president Sabon Peggy goes into detail and explaining what is going on behind the scenes. So in the end, what we are going to get is a South Africa that is governed by the private sector and the NGOs with the states playing some minimal part that's stage number three stage number three and this as you can see it happening already the municipal councils can't fill potholes the citizens collect themselves and they collect money and fill the potholes Government can't give us electricity. The mining companies produce their own electricity. Policing is not effective, so I hire private security services. So he says gradually you can see this happening. In the end, what we're going to have is a South Africa camp governed by the private sector and the NGOs. And the democratic state will be a tiny little role. What that means is the condition of the majority of the poor in this country won't change. Because the private sector is not about to care about that majority. You need a strong democratic state to take care of this matter of inequality. But they say, he says, you can see it's disappearing. The democratic state. And that's where we're going. What do we do about all of those challenges? Those questions will not be answered by the elections. They must be answered by something else. What that something else is, I don't know. That thanks a lot. So thank you for the disaster of ESCOM. ESCOM, interesting thing. It is the one and only thing that gives us a chance to make a difference in this election. For all the people that are poor, afraid, homeless, and have no money, South African Airways is meaningless to them. Transnet is meaningless to them. Trucks clogging up the roads and polluting. 
is meaningless to them. But when they, in their villages, in their homeless areas, in their tin shacks, when the electricity goes down, their one and only device that connects them to the modern world does not work, and they are in darkness. ESCOM is the message to voters that the ANC is failing. And ESCOM is the one and only thing that has made a big difference to voter perception because they know the ANC isn't working. So thank you for the disaster of ESCOM. I'm saying it's deliberate. It's people who have wanted to produce this electricity crisis in the same way that they wanted to produce a resource a revenue crisis by the destruction of SARS. You look at all of the state institutions, look at Transnet, look at what's happened to the police service, look at the prosecution. All of these things going wrong, systematically, is it an accident? It's not. That is why I'm saying this question that was raised by your colleague from the Northern Cape is important. It was not only people being marginalized after the 2007 ANC conference. There's a whole process that takes place in this country which still we don't understand. Of a systematic process to ensure that the Democratic Republic doesn't succeed. That's one of the things I think it's necessary for us to understand. Because it would then help us also to understand even the question that's raised about crime. None of these negative things that happen in this period identified by the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, none of them are accidental. None of them are a result of greed. So there is greed. So there is corruption. But at the base of it all is to make sure that we fail. <laughs> it's necessary to understand that what is it that is wrong in order to be able to find the right answers as to what is to be done. as to what is to be done. I must apologize for all of this long presentation. But I think it's a matter of strategic importance uh, for the future of our country to understand what went wrong. I'm saying because there were deliberate processes put in place by some people to make sure that this democratic republic fails. That's a matter that still we need to still discuss even with the ANC. Hmm. I don't think the ANC understands that reality. Um, it is true that we have got many greedy people many corrupt people. If, you, if I ask the question, I ask the question, why is it ANC which marginalized people as we in the day as we are saying? Why is it behaving like this? The question remains, like on the crime issue, what is to be done? What do we do to defeat these people who systematically want to destroy this democratic state? Who are they? Now, these negotiators, because they are treasurers in nature, have decided to betray this revolution. Now they want to take it from the back door. We will never allow this revolution to go astray. We will never allow this revolution to be stolen. And this time, they better be warned.
we will never accept a just settlement. That's the point of the political will that we're talking about. But this is a setup in which the transformation of this country has been difficult. Who's that is why, the day, Mr. That is why, no, Tony, please, 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 don't be that simplistic. You are senior here. Let me tell you uh, 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 the, the real issues here about South Africa. That's why we're fighting against Cape terrorism. The, the, the people are controlling, the corporations that are controlling the resources that every single day have been contesting government. Every time government wants to bring in radical measures to transform people's life, they pose uh, uh, problems of uh, 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 challenges in the economy, withdrawing resources, disinvestment, and so forth and so forth. And the issue of a responsible government, that is why in our message today, we have said a new pact has to be un un undertaken because those that we signed the, the peaceful transition, which was also important because we do not want to, uh, our country to be, uh, to be flooded with blood, people were dying on the eve of freedom. We felt that after over 300 years of colonialism, we needed to reach a point where the universal suffrage could take place, the people can democratically decide their government. At that point in time, the political transfer of power, that's why we characterize it as democratic breakthrough, not freedom. But of course, we nominally celebrate freedom, April 27, which came on the blood of this material crisis that we are talking about. So in this particular context, we have not captured economic power. We captured political power that allowed us to transform society democratically, to put a democratic constitution. All those things that we are talking about, we are taking them through the constitution. It is capital that is taking government to court to, to refrain from transformative laws or implementation of critical transformative laws. But it doesn't mean that there are no witnesses in government. We must deal with those witnesses across the board, including witnesses that have protected uh, finance capital in the main, which has become dominant and has actually become a parallel government. The question was raised about leadership. <coughs> leadership. I am saying that in, in our case, the first, first thing we've got to do about our leadership here is to get people to understand South Africa. I'm sure if you lined up uh, the leaders of these political parties who are contesting elections, and you said to them, how many of you have read the Nugent Report? I doubt if there's any one of them. <laughs> it's a very complex question, and uh, when we raise this, that there was some intervention that was made which results in this change. People take time to absorb that. Because it's too dramatic, I suppose. It's too... The last thing I would say is that uh, Dr. Andres says stage three which is the end of this transformation process. He says you can see the signs of stage three already in stage two. So in the end, what you are going to get is a South Africa that is governed by the private sector and the NGOs, with the states playing some minimal part. That's stage number three. Age number three. And this says you can see it happening already. The municipal councils can't fill potholes. The citizens collect themselves and they collect money and fill the potholes. Government can't give us electricity. The mining companies produce their own electricity. Policing is not effective, so I hire private security services. So he says gradually you can see this happening. In the end, what we are going to have is a South Africa governed by the private sector and the NGOs. And the democratic state will be a tiny little role. Mm. What that means 
is the condition of the majority of the poor in this country won't change. Because the private sector is not about to care about that majority. You need a strong democratic state to take care of this matter of inequality. But they say, he says, you can see it's disappearing. The democratic state. And that's where we're going. What do we do about all of those challenges? Those questions will not be answered by the elections. They must be answered by something else. What that something else is, I don't know. But thanks a lot. So there's a concept called state proofing that has been introduced a number of years ago, but has been caught the national attention, at least for the opposition. And state proofing is protecting yourself against the actions of the government. And it's quite depressing when you think about people and companies having to do that, to state proof yourself. It's have your own electricity, have your own water supply, try and have your own security, try and educate your children privately, you know, try and have private medical, because you know the government cannot provide these services. They're incompetent. I'm saying it's deliberate. It's people who have wanted to produce this electricity crisis in the same way that they wanted to produce a resource, a revenue crisis by the destruction of sons. You look at all of the state institutions, look at Transnet, look at what's happened to the police service, look at the prosecution. All of these things going wrong, systematically. Is it an accident? It's not. And that is why I'm saying this question that was raised by your colleague from the Northern Cape is important. It was not only people being marginalized after 2007 ANC conference. There's a whole process that takes place in this country which still we don't understand. Mm. Of a systematic process to ensure that the democratic republic doesn't succeed. That's one of the things I think it's necessary for us to understand. Because it would then help us also to understand even the question that's raised about crime. None of these negative things that happen in this period identified by the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, none of them are accidental. None of them are a result of greed. So there is greed. So there is corruption. But at the base of it all is to make sure that we fail. <clears throat> it's necessary to understand that. What is it that is wrong? In order to be able to find the right answers as to what is to be done. as to what is to be done. I must apologize for all of this long presentation, but I think it's a matter of strategic importance uh, for the future of our country to understand what went wrong. I'm saying because there were deliberate processes put in place by some people to make sure that this democratic republic fails. That's a matter that still we need to still discuss even with the ANC. Hmm. I don't think the ANC understands that reality. Um, it is true that you have got many greedy people many corrupt people. If, you, if I ask the question, 
I asked the question, why is it ANC, which marginalized people, as you indicated, as we are saying, why is it behaving like this? In 2000, uh, not 2000, in 1997, the Nelson Mandela says, addressing an ANC conference, that something wrong is happening. Which is that as the ANC were attracting into our ranks, people who are not ANC. People don't have the values of the ANC. But they can see that to be a member of the ANC is to have a step ladder to government in order to have the possibility to steal. So, <laughs> That's 1997 National Conference. That message has been repeated in all of the national conferences since then. But nothing has ever been done to get rid of these ones. 